Let me now tell you about love and friendship in Hardy and Lawrence's lives. Many younger writers sought to make Hardy's acquaintance when in his 80s he had become the most popular English writer of his time. And those encounters pleased him greatly as he confided in a letter. I am getting to know quite a lot of the young Georgians and have quite a paternal feeling or grand paternal towards them. Among those young writers uh, were John Middleton Murray, Siegfried Sassoon and E.M. Foster, who were often invited to visit Hardy at Max Gate, which was the house he had built himself near Dorchester. Foster is known to have said of his, ho his host, such a nice man, he always wanted to know if you had had enough tea. J.M. Barry was no doubt the closest of Hardy's friends in later life, and he contributed to his posthumous fame, first by securing him a burial in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey, and then later by helping Florence Hardy, Hardy's second wife, to uh, compose and publish the life and works of Thomas Hardy. Through their mutual friend, Lady Cynthia Asquith, uh, whom Hardy also knew, Lawrence exchanged letters with Barry and finally met him in London, but it seems that further acquaintance between the two authors was undermined by Lawrence's friendship with Barry's former wife, Mary Ansell, and her second husband, Gilbert Cannon. In spite of their mutual friends, Lawrence was never introduced to Hardy, probably because Lawrence was abroad during those years when Middleton Murray, Sassoon and others were befriending the senior writer, but also because Lawrence shunned the kind of London society which Hardy had sought as a younger man and been accepted into. Hardy's social aspirations led him to cultivate upper-class connections, uh, to appear as frequently as possible in the social on the social scene, and to display a surprising amount of vanity in recording all these high society events in his letters and then in his biography. The aristocracy also held a degree of fascination for Lawrence, of course, and yet it seems that he was more attracted to the glamour and beauty of old families and country seats than to the possibilities of social advancement that they might represent for himself. Although he did profit from the influence of the likes of Lady Ottoline Morel and Lady Cynthia Asquith. Now, Frida, as the daughter of the Baron von Richthofen, would have impressed the young Lawrence with her education and refinement, and yet her emancipated ways and her disregard for decorum after their elopement set her apart from the high-born ladies that Hardy took pride in visiting. Frida showed no interest in socialising with the upper class, while Hardy's first wife, Emma, actively encouraged her husband to pursue uh, his social climbing aspirations, but then she resented being kept apart from his social success. Where Frieda's intellectual contribution to and steadfast support of Lawrence's talent and career did much to help him to become the productive writer that we know, Hardy had to contend with a life partner whose literary aspirations and limited talent were overshadowed by his success, breeding envy and frustration on her part. The two women, uh, three if we include Hardy's second wife Florence, were vastly opposed in their characters as well as in their relationships uh, to their husbands. Now, Hardy's hesitant courtship of Emma Gifford contrasted with Lawrence's passion for Frida as much as Lawrence and Frida's open, tempestuous but generally harmonious relationship as a married couple 
differed from Hardy and Emma's strained and eventually estranged married life, followed after Emma's death by an affectionate but lacklustre marriage with Hardy's second wife Florence, who was 40 years younger than her husband. So to finish, um, I mentioned that the two authors had vastly opposite personalities. Uh, despite his early and continuing success as a writer of serial fiction, Thomas Hardy suffered from a chronic sense of inferiority and lack of confidence in his artistic powers. Critics ascribe such vulnerability to, uh, here's a quotation uh, from Milgate, the notion that his family had come down in the world from illustrious ancestors. Uh, among these ancestors were landowners, the founder of the local grammar school, and Admiral Thomas Hardy, who was Nelson's flag captain at Trafalgar. And yet this sense of social downfall, which Hardy had, became the cornerstone of his most famous novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, in which the Derby Field family is believed to descend from the noble D'Urbervilles and bitterly lament their decline into poverty and obscurity. Nevertheless, uh, Hardy's humble country origins and absence of university education made him acutely sensitive to any criticism on matters of worldly knowledge, artistic style and philosophy. Um, he was deeply troubled by any negative reviews of his works and then he would regularly answer critics' reproaches in long fastidious letters in defence of himself and his art, which he sometimes published publicly, uh, and that always left him even more dismayed by the feeling that his artistic endeavours should be so little understood. Lawrence, on the other hand, comes across as being much more self-assured, both as a writer and in everyday life, and also much freer in his habits, thoughts and relationships, despite his persistent puritanical mind. His letters display a volcanic personality, spontaneous and unaffected, uh, which resurfaces in his literary work. Friends' testimonies describe him as a playful figure who delighted in entertaining them with imitations and charades, and we as readers of his fiction, poems, essays and plays can easily imagine uh, that talent in the light of the vivacious characters and dialogues he created. If, however, Hardy was rather shy, silent and gentle as a private person, where Lawrence could be sullen, affectionate or boisterous, the two writers shared the same spirit of boldness in their art, the need to confront controversial topics and run the risk of censure by their decidedly modern take on the society of their times.